Chapter forty seven of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter forty seven. Jeremy in danger. Nothing very long abides, as the greatest of all writers, in whose extent I am for ever lost in raptured wonder, and yet for ever quite at home as if his heart were mine, although his brain so different. In a word, as Mr. William Shakespeare, in every one of his works, insists with a humoured melancholy. And if my journey to London led to nothing else of advancement, it took me a hundred years in front of what I might else have been by the most simple accident. Two women were scolding one another across the road, very violently, both from upstairs windows, and I, in my hurry for quiet life, and not knowing what might come down upon me, quickened my step for the nearest corner. But suddenly something fell on my head, and at first I was afraid to look, especially as it weighed heavily. But hearing no breakage of wear, and only the other scold laughing heartily, I turned me around and espied a book, which one had cast at the other, hoping to break her window. So I took the book and tendered it at the door of the house from which it had fallen, but the watchman came along just then, and the man at the door declared that it never came from their house, and begged me to say no more. This I promised readily, never wishing to make mischief, and I said, "'Good, sir, now take the book. I will go on to my business.' But he answered that he would do no such thing, for the book alone, being hurled so hard, would convict his people of a lewd assault, and he begged me, if I would do a good turn, to put the book under my coat and go. And so I did, in part at least, for I did not put the book under my coat, but went along with it openly, looking for any to challenge it. Now this book, so acquired, has been not only the joy of my younger days and main delight of my manhood, but also the comfort, and even the hope, of my now declining years. In a word, it is next to my Bible to me, and written in equal English, and if you aspire any goodness whatever in my own loose style of writing, you must not thank me, John Ridd, for it, but the writer who holds the champion's belt in wit, as I once did in wrestling. Now, as nothing very long abides, it cannot be expected that a woman's anger should last very long, if she be at all of the proper sort. And my mother, being one of the very best, could not long retain her wrath against the squire Fagus, especially when she came to reflect upon Annie's suggestion, how natural, and one might say how inevitable it was, that a young man, fond of adventure and change, and winning good profits by jeopardy, should not settle down, without some regrets, to a fixed abode and a life of sameness, however safe and respectable. And even as Annie put the case, Tom deserved the greater credit for vanquishing so nobly these yearnings of his nature, and it seemed very hard to upbraid him, considering how good his motives were. Neither could Annie understand how Mother could reconcile it with her knowledge of the Bible, and the one sheep that was lost, and the hundredth piece of silver, and the man that went down to Jericho. Whether Annie's logic was good and sound, I am sure I cannot tell, but it seemed to me that she ought to have left the Jericho traveller alone, inasmuch as he rather fell among Tom Faggus's than resembled them. However, her reasoning was too much for Mother to hold out against, and Tom was replaced, and more than that, being regarded now as an injured man. But how my mother contrived to know that because she had been too hard upon Tom he must be right about the necklace, is a point which I never could clearly perceive, though no doubt she could explain it. To prove herself right in that conclusion, she went herself to fetch Lorna, that the trinket might be examined before the day grew dark. My darling came in, with a very quick glance and smile at my cigarro, for I was having the third by this time to keep things in amity, and I waved it towards her, as much as to say, You see that I can do it. And then mother led her up to the light, for Tom to examine her necklace. On the shapely curve of her neck it hung, like dewdrops upon a white hyacinth, and I was vexed that Tom should have the chance to see it there. But even if she had read my thoughts, or outrun them with her own, Lorna turned away, and softly took the jewels from the place which so much adorned them. And as she turned away, they sparkled through the rich dark waves of hair. Then she laid the glittering circlet in my mother's hands, and Tom Faggus took it eagerly, and bore it to the window. "'Don't you go out of sight,' I said. "'You cannot resist such things as those, if they be what you think them.' "'Jack, I shall have to trounce thee yet. "'I am now a man of honour, and entitled to the duello. "'What will you take for it, Mistress Lorna? "'At a hazard, say now.' "'I am not accustomed to sell things, sir,' replied Lorna. "'He did not like him much, else she would have answered sportively. "'What is it worth, in your opinion?' "'Do you think it is worth five pounds now?' 
"'Oh, no! I never had so much money as that in all my life. "'It is very bright and very pretty, but it cannot be worth five pounds, I am sure.' "'What a chance for a bargain! Oh, if it were not for any, I could make my fortune!' "'But, sir, I would not sell it to you, not for twenty times five pounds. "'My grandfather was so kind about it, and I think it belonged to my mother.' There are twenty-five rose diamonds in it, and twenty-five large brilliants that cannot be matched in London. How say you, Mistress Lorna, to a hundred thousand pounds? My darling's eyes so flashed at this, brighter than any diamond, that I said to myself, Well, all have faults, and now I have found out Lorna's, she is fond of money. And then I sighed rather heavily, for of all faults this seems to me one of the worst in a woman. But even before my sigh was finished I had cause to condemn myself for Lorna took the necklace very quietly from the hand of Squire Faggus, who had not half done with admiring it, and she went up to my mother, with the sweetest smile I ever saw. "'Dear kind mother, I am so glad,' she said in a whisper, coaxing mother out of sight of all but me. "'Now you will have it, won't you, dear? And I shall be so happy, for a thousandth part of your kindness to me no jewels in the world can match.' I cannot lay before you the grace with which she did it, all the air of seeking favour rather than conferring it, and the high-bred fear of giving offence, which is of all fears the noblest. Mother knew not what to say. Of course, she would never dream of taking such a gift as that, and yet she saw how sadly Lorna would be disappointed. Therefore, Mother did from habit what she almost always did. She called me to help her. But knowing that my eyes were full, for anything noble moves me so, quite as rashly as things pitiful, I pretended not to hear my mother, but to see a wild cat in the dairy. Therefore I cannot tell what mother said in reply to Lorna, for when I came back, quite eager to let my love know how I worshipped her, and how deeply I was ashamed of myself, for meanly wronging her in my heart, behold, Tom Faggus had gotten again the necklace which had such charms for him, and was delivering all around, but especially to Annie, who was wondering at his learning, a dissertation on precious stones and his sentiments about those in his hand. He said that the work was very ancient, but undoubtedly very good. The cutting of every line was true, and every angle was in its place. And this, he said, made all the difference in the lustre of the stone, and therefore in its value. For if the facets were ill-matched, and the points of light so ever little out of perfect harmony, all the lustre of the jewel would be loose and wavering, and the central fire dulled, instead of answering as it should to all possibilities of gaze, and overpowering any eye intent on its deep mysteries. We laughed at the squire's dissertation, for how should he know all these things, being nothing better, and indeed much worse, than a mere North Moulton blacksmith? And he took our laughter with much good nature, having Annie to squeeze his hand and convey her grief at our ignorance. But he said that of one thing he was quite certain, and therein I believed him. To wit, that a trinket of this kind never could have belonged to any ignoble family, but to one of the very highest and most wealthy in England. And looking at Lorna, I felt that she must have come from a higher source than the very best of diamonds. Tom Faggus said that the necklace was made, he would answer for it, in Amsterdam, two or three hundred years ago, long before London jewellers had begun to meddle with diamonds. And on the gold clasp he found some letters, done in some inverted way, the meaning of which was beyond him, also a bearing of some kind, which he believed was a mountain cat and thereupon he declared that now he had earned another glass of snaps, and would Mistress Lorna mix it for him. I was amazed at his impudence, and Annie, who thought this her business, did not look best pleased, and I hoped that Lorna would tell him at once to go and do it for himself. But instead of that she rose to do it with a soft humility, which went direct to the heart of Tom, and he leaped up with a curse at himself, and took the hot water from her, and would not allow her to do anything except to put the sugar in, and then he bowed to her grandly. I knew what Lorna was thinking of. She was thinking all the time that her necklace had been taken by the dunes with violence upon some great robbery, and that Squire Faggus knew it, though he would not show his knowledge, and that this was perhaps the reason why Mother had refused it so. We said no more about the necklace for a long time afterwards. Neither did my darling wear it, now that she knew its value, but did not know its history. She came to me the very next day, trying to look cheerful, and begged me if I loved her, never mind how little, to take charge of it again, as I once had done before, and not even to let her know in what place I stored it. I told her that this last request I could not comply with, for having been round her neck so often, it was now a sacred thing, 
more than a million pounds could be. Therefore it should dwell for the present in the neighbourhood of my heart, and so could not be far from her. At this she smiled her own sweet smile, and touched my forehead with her lips, and wished that she could only learn how to deserve such love as mine. Tom Faggus took his good departure, which was a kind farewell to me, on the very day I am speaking of, the day after his arrival. Tom was a thoroughly upright man, according to his own standard, and you might rely upon him always, up to a certain point, I mean, to be there or thereabouts. But sometimes things were too many for Tom, especially with ardent spirits, and then he judged, perhaps too much, with only himself for the jury. At any rate, I would trust him fully for candour and for honesty, in almost every case in which he himself could have no interest. And so we got on very well together, and he thought me a fool, and I tried my best not to think anything worse of him. Scarcely was Tom clean out of sight, and Annie's tears not dry yet, for she always made a point of crying upon his departure, when in came Master Jeremy Stickles, splashed with mud from head to foot, and not in the very best of humours, but happy to get back again. "'Curse those fellows!' he cried, with a stamp which sent the water hissing from his boot upon the embers. "'A pretty plight you may call this, for His Majesty's Commissioner to return to his headquarters in. "'Any, my dear?' for he was always very affable with Annie. "'Will you help me off with my overalls, and then turn your pretty hand to the gridiron? "'Not a blessed morsel have I touched for more than twenty-four hours.' "'Surely, then, you must be quite starving, sir,' my sister replied, with the greatest zeal, for she did love a man with an appetite. "'How glad I am that the fire is clear!' But Lizzie, who happened to be there, said with her peculiar smile, "'Master Stickles must be used to it, for he never comes back without telling us that.' "'Hush!' cried Annie, quite shocked with her. "'How would you like to be used to it? Now, Betty, be quick with the things for me. Pork or mutton or deer's meat, sir, we have some cured since the autumn.' "'Oh, dear's meat, by all means,' Jeremy Stickles answered. "'I have tasted none since I left you, though dreaming of it often. "'Well, this is better than being chased over the moors for one's life, John. "'All the way from Landacre Bridge I have ridden a race for my precious life, "'at the peril of my limbs and neck. Three great dunes galloping after me, "'and a good job for me that they were so big, or they must have overtaken me.' "'Just go and see to my horse, John. That's an excellent lad. "'He deserves a good turn this day from me, and I will render it to him.' "'However, he left me to do it, while he made himself comfortable. "'And in truth, the horse required care. "'He was blown so that he could hardly stand, and plastered with mud, "'and steaming so that the stable was quite full of it. "'By the time I had put the poor fellow to rights, his master had finished dinner, "'and was in a more pleasant humour, having even offered to kiss any out of pure gratitude, as he said, but any answered with spirit that gratitude must not be shown by increasing the obligation. Jeremy made reply to this, that his only way to be grateful then was to tell us his story, and so did at greater length than I can here repeat it, for it does not bear particularly upon Lorna's fortunes. It appears that as he was riding towards us from the town of South Moulton in Devonshire, he found the roads very soft and heavy, and the floods out in all directions, but met with no other difficulty until he came to Landacre Bridge. He had only a single trooper with him, a man not of the militia, but of the king's army, whom Jeremy had brought from Exeter. As these two descended towards the bridge, they observed that both the Kensford water and the river Baal were pouring down in mighty floods from the melting of the snow. So great indeed was the torrent, after they united, that only the parapets of the bridge could be seen above the water, and the road across either bank being covered and very deep on the hither side. The trooper did not like the look of it, and proposed to ride back again, and round by way of Simon's Bath, where the stream is smaller. But Stickles would not have it so, and, dashing into the river, swam his horse for the bridge, and gained it with some little trouble. And there he found the water not more than up to his horse's knees, perhaps. On the crown of the bridge he turned his horse to watch the trooper's passage, and to help him with directions, when suddenly he saw him fall headlong into the torrent, and heard the report of a gun from behind and felt a shock to his own body, such as lifted him out of the saddle. Turning round, he beheld three men, risen up from behind the hedge on one side of his onward road, two of them ready to load again, and one with his gun unfired, waiting to get good aim at him. Then Jeremy did a gallant thing, for which I doubt whether I should have had the presence of mind in the danger. 
he saw that to swim his horse back again would be almost certain death as affording such a target where even a wound must be fatal therefore he struck the spurs into the nag and rode through the water straight at the man who was pointing the long gun at him if the horse had been carried off his legs there must have been an end of jeremy for the other men were getting ready to have another shot at him but luckily the horse galloped right on without any need for swimming being himself excited no doubt by all he had seen and heard of it and jeremy lay almost flat on his neck so as to give little space for good aim with the mane tossing wildly in front of him now if that young fellow with the gun had his brains as ready as his flint was he would have shot the horse at once and then had stickles at his mercy but instead of that he let fly at the man and missed him altogether being scared perhaps by the pistol which jeremy showed him the mouth of and galloping by at full speed master stickles tried to leave his mark behind him for he changed the aim of his pistol to the biggest man who was loading his gun and cursing like ten cannons but the pistol missed fire no doubt from the flood which had gurgled in over the holsters and jeremy seeing three horses tethered at a gate just up the hill knew that he had not yet escaped but had more of danger behind him he tried his other great pistol at one of the horses tethered there so as to lessen if possible the number of his pursuers but the powder again failed him and he durst not stop to cut the bridles hearing the men coming up the hill so he even made the most of his start thanking god that his weight was light compared at least to what theirs was and another thing he had noticed which gave him some hope of escaping to wit that the horses of the dunes although very handsome animals were suffering still from the bitter effects of the late long frost and the scarcity of fodder if they do not catch me up or shoot me in the course of the first two miles i may see my home again this was what he said to himself as he turned to mark what they were about from the brow of the steep hill he saw the flooded valley shining with the breadth of water and the trooper's horse on the other side shaking his drenched flanks and neighing and half way down the hill he saw the three dunes mounting hastily and then he knew that his only chance lay in the stoutness of his steed the horse was in pretty good condition and the rider knew him thoroughly and how to make the most of him and though they had travelled some miles that day through very heavy ground the bath in the river had washed the mud off and been some refreshment therefore stickles encouraged his nag and put him into a good hard gallop heading away towards withycombe at first he had thought of turning to the right and making off for withypool a mile or so down the valley but his good sense told him that no one there would dare to protect him against the dunes so he resolved to go on his way yet faster than he had intended the three villains came after him with all the speed they could muster making sure from the badness of the road that he must stick fast ere long and so be at their mercy and this was jeremy's chiefest fear for the ground being soft and thoroughly rotten after so much frost and snow the poor horse had terrible work of it with no time to pick the way and even more good luck than skill was needed to keep him from foundering how jeremy prayed for an exmoor fog such as he had often sworn at that he might turn aside and lurk while his pursuers went past him but no fog came nor even a storm to damp the priming of their guns neither was wood or coppice nigh nor any place to hide in only hills and moor and valleys with flying shadows over them and great banks of snow in the corners at one time poor stickles was quite in despair for after leaping a little brook which crosses the track at newland he stuck fast in a dancing bog as we call them upon exmoor the horse had broken through the crust of moss and sedge and marish weed and could do nothing but wallow and sink with the black water spurting over him and jeremy struggling with all his might saw the three villains now topping the crest less than a furlong behind him and heard them shout in their savage delight with the calmness of despair he yet resolved to have one more try for it and scrambling over the horse's head gained firm land and tugged at the bridle the poor nag replied with all his power to the call upon his courage and reared his forefeet out of the slough and with straining eyeballs gazed at him now said jeremy now my fine fellow lifting him with the bridle and the brave beast gathered the roll of his loins and sprang from his quagmired haunches one more spring and he was on earth again instead of being under it and jeremy leapt on his back and stooped for he knew that they would fire two bullets whistled over him as the horse mad with fright dashed forward and in five minutes more he had come to the x and the pursuers had fallen behind him the x though a much smaller stream than the bal now ran in a foaming torrent unbridged and too wide for leaping 
but Jeremy's horse took the water well, and both he and his rider were lightened as well as comforted by it. And as they passed towards Luckett Hill, and struck upon the founts of Lynn, the horses of the three pursuers began to tire under them. Then Jeremy Stickles knew that if he could only escape the sloughs he was safe for the present, and so he stood up in his stirrups and gave them a loud halloo, as if they had been so many foxes. Their only answer was to fire the remaining charge at him, but the distance was too great for any aim from horseback, and the dropping bullet idly ploughed the sod upon one side of him. He acknowledged it with a wave of his hat, and laid one thumb to his nose, in the manner fashionable in London for expression of contempt. However, they followed him yet further, hoping to make him pay out dearly, if he should only miss the track or fall upon morasses. But the neighbourhood of our Lynn stream is not so very boggy, and the king's messenger now knew his way as well as any of his pursuers did, and so he arrived at Plover's Barrows, thankful and in rare appetite. "'But was the poor soldier drowned?' asked Annie. "'And you never went to look for him. Oh, how very dreadful!' "'Shot or drowned, I know not which. Thank God it was only a trooper. But they shall pay for it, as dearly as if it had been a captain.' "'And how was it that you were struck by a bullet, and only shaken in your saddle? "'Had you a coat of mail on, or a Milanese chain armour? "'Now, Master Stickles, had you?' "'No, Mistress Lizzie, we do not wear things of that kind nowadays. "'You are apt, I perceive, at romances. "'But I happen to have a little flat bottle of the best stoneware slung beneath my saddle-cloak, "'and filled with the very best eau de vie from the George Hotel at South Moulton. "'The brand of it now is upon my back.' Oh, the murderous scoundrels, what a brave spirit they have spilled. You had better set to and thank God, said I, that they have not spilled a braver one. End of chapter 47 Read by Landy in Sydney, Australia, October 2008